Um, so this was my title page. Um, I've spoken about it. This is the gate of the university where I am right now the vice chancellor and I've been away from JNU for the past four months. Uh, it's been uh, strange and not, not uh, strange though, but uh, challenging and therefore nice. Um, okay. Uh, well, I was on this slide and what I wanted to, uh, I was speaking about is if you, you uh, interestingly, if you try to check the meaning, dictionary meaning of persuasion, this is the, the example you see. However, what I wish to state is the history of reservation in India is not a new thing, okay? Or historically, India has had reservation and especially in jobs and or rather we would find in Indian history or history of India, the, the history of reservation for jobs. Now, how do I this, uh, substantiate this? What I would like to uh, say is, the caste system is actually the strict structure and the system which has done this reservation, okay? Um, and there, it was not by merit, but by birth, okay? By one's own um, you know, genetic makeup, because you were born, you and I were born in certain family, which belong to certain past, our jobs were predefined. And so I would like to, and this is not my original idea, one of my friends from, my previous institution, um, I have borrowed this uh, concept from him. I wouldn't want to uh, use his name, but uh, yeah, therefore. Uh, I would like to make the statement that history of reservation in India is, uh, is quite an old one. In fact, it's deeply rooted and it is rooted and it turned out to be a, res a, ca a caste system, okay? So, uh, um, and so therefore, for certain kinds of jobs, you needed to be born in that caste and only then you could do that. Or in fact, even education for that matter. Unless you and I were born in certain caste, we couldn't be educated too. So therefore, I would like to pitch the word reservation at that, okay? And so, but then reservation policy with, and historically, it turned out to be uglier and uglier again, to the extent the rights of citizens were also denied and uh, what about, uh, not various privileges, but just a basic right of equality, okay? Right to be treated as human, right to be treated with dignity was also deprived um, and that went on to get uglier. The possessions were also taken away I mean, people were uh, dispossessed of what they owned earlier. And uh, so it got muckier and it got the, uh, more and more painful and um, ugly. Um, however, I think we have had the history, again, we have had the history of great thinkers in our country, starting from, you know, sometimes certain historians would like to bring in the names of Raja Ramohan Roy, who talked about Sati Pratha and etc. and how he would try to demolish that. But we have had also history of the Fule couple. Okay, we have had history of others, such thinkers who have been social uh, social thinkers who had taken efforts to break that system, which confined the person to only doing certain kind of job. And so, so therefore, uh, I think um, um, the beginning of what we see now as a reservation policy does lie somewhere and around the era when Pule uh, couple got very, was so convinced that education was one of the ways in breaking those chains of the system called caste system. And only if one was educated would be able to um, even exercise within the given restrictions um, that could be right as a human also. So, and that continued to come up to, uh, we, even if we uh, try to quote the experience of Gandhi in um, you know, South Africa, um, and, uh, but then they weren't substantial work done until and unless uh, uh, Dr. Bhim Rao Ambedkar, Baba Sahib Ambedkar, he, with his life experience, was then able to see the 
definite tools which could possibly uh, bring about this vision of equality, justice, fraternity, and etc. that he tried to enshrine in the Indian constitution. Okay? Therefore, reservation policy as we see in India is, which uh, in other places, other countries is otherwise known as affirmative action, the, 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 the objective of uh, um, um, reservation policy is affirmative action. What, what is that? That is representation of historically and historically and even currently disadvantaged um, groups in Indian society. Okay, so those who have been historically systematically deprived of privileges as citizens, and education being one of the education, health uh, care, and etc., but then education being the one of the primary um, the, such, um, uh, it's not a privilege, but a right, um, uh, where have been de uh, de denied. So therefore, the, uh, the, um, the, uh, yeah, the objective of affirmative action was to have representation in education, representation in employment, representation in politics. And what we would see, we can see the Article 15 of the uh, Constitution of India and mostly more specifically, various, we have uh, Article uh, 16, um, again, A, B, and etc., which have more categorically um, uh, verbalized the provisions to ensure that any socially and educationally backward class uh, um, uh, or, or citizens coming from these class, uh, classes could have access to or who could have uh, representation in education and employment and even um, uh, politics. And so equality, which has been envisaged as per uh, the constitution of India, could be only possible with, uh, with the policy uh, making rights for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes who, who have been historically disadvantaged, okay? Disadvantaged from having representation in, you know, access to education or even jobs, anywhere the, the employment may be, besides, besides, the, besides the kind of job that was traditionally done as a family, uh, 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 tradition or confining to the caste system. So, uh, so this is the, the, this this is what was the objective of reservation policy. So, but then how is it that to be done? Because there were this historical disadvantages. So, I mean, it, um, it therefore it was seen that okay. Let me use another uh, thing. I'm um, just mention it before I forget. Is reservation is also not reserving a specified share to some people. So it's not like you no know, um, share of the pie. Okay, uh, that if the uh, percentage of population is this X, then there should be X percent of share that must be reserved it's not that in fact the policy as is ver verbalized and also needs to implement be implemented likewise is by we allowing that in order to make way for that representation reservation policy guides that there be relaxation in age for example if uh, let's say if uh, 22 years or 25 years is supposed to be the maximum age for applying for something in job then maybe you'd see on a standard basis like you no know, there is a five years uh, relaxation now those five years relaxation so if a person with a maximum age of 30 could, uh, from, but then coming from the disadvantaged groups could avail that Okay. Uh, now, the second thing which normally comes and becomes the, more, the biggest bone of contention is the relaxation in the eligibility marks. We can discuss a lot on this and there can be a lecture just on this. But then 
we do see that if the eligibility to apply, let's say for an engineer or somebody to be you know, eligible to apply, 55% is the minimum, that's the minimum eligibility marks or that's the minimum mark that one is required to have in order to um, you know, um, participate in the entrance exam of JNU. But then the students or aspirants coming from the disadvantaged groups, specifically SC and SC, they have a 5% of relaxation. And so for them, it becomes 50. Okay, so there is a fixed um, uh, um, uh, measure, a quantum, which is um, uh, allowed to be used for relaxation. Likewise for fee, even sometimes for application fee and also fee, um, you know, once one gets uh, admission, so there may be fee concession, it is said, and that's the relaxation. So, so admission policy, basically in order to achieve that representation, tries to do or try uh, uh, specifies these are the specifications that there be relaxation the second thing is also about reservation policy across the country we do have that there is there there, there have been a Supreme Court order um I, I do know some of the lawyers must be also participants uh, 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 listening but um, who can help us i think in Rasani case or one of the cases that in the judgment uh, mentioned that the reservation for disadvantaged groups, of their representation cannot exceed 50%. Okay, so that's the ceiling. 50%, okay, 50% of the share only, maximum 50% of the share only can be reserved. Okay, which has got a good and uh, well side, also positive and the negative side also. The negative is, therefore, not, not, not negative is not the, uh, uh, what I'm saying is not really negative. Now, if 50%, of the space is reserved, that's not the proportionate share of the population who is going to be allowed to avail this kind of relaxation. Okay, so therefore, 50% is less than the percentage uh, share of the population. And therefore, what I said earlier, this is not a share that reservation policy does not allow access to the so called so called fair share, but not, it's not proportionate share. All right, so reservation is there only for 50%. The third thing we need to be mindful of a reservation policy is applied, and these days you would see the policies also say there is a vertical reservation, okay, and there is something called a horizontal reservation. Now, what is vertical? You put, I mean, um, most of you are science students, and therefore I can uh, talk about the, in the histograms, right? Each bin. It's a vertical. It goes by the number of uh, instances, right, or frequency of uh, the case, right. So, so therefore, if if we consider a bin for SC, bin for ST, a bin for OBC, now the SC and ST the reservation for ST and SC is rooted in the, um, the the articles in the Constitution, right. The OBC reservation has come about by um, the, the act. Uh, of uh, and it was uh, also accepted in the parliament likewise act of parliament is also the reservation for uh, uh, people with disability so pwd or physically challenged also as we say okay and most recently we've had the latest amendment of 2019 also brings about reservation for economically weaker section okay so we have these many sections only or categories for which we have the five uh, uh, sc st obc physically challenged and ews okay so we've got five categories for which there can be a reservation now we can we, we do have we can imagine the histogram sort of thing for sc for st for obc and for physically challenged for the pwd okay now, so therefore, that becomes um, uh, uh, you know, vertical, and there, depending on depending on the size of the bin, certain percentage of that bin is going to be reserved for that category. Okay, but that's not the case for uh, people with disability. It is said that reservation for uh, people with disability would be horizontal, which means. They are there. They cannot be another bin called physically challenged, and then have 
whatever percent, uh, you know, three percent was earlier, but now it's become four percent in most of the states. Um, okay, four percent used to be reserved for um, like a quota. The word quota also used to be used earlier, okay, for the PWD, but now it is no more. So the, for the PWD section, it is said to be uh, horizontal. Why? Because in each of these categories, that is scheduled caste, scheduled tribe. Uh, people coming from OBC background, but non creamy layer, um, and also economically weaker section. In each of these sections, we can find physically challenged people because this is a natural disadvantage, okay? And this na nature based or natural disadvantage can be observed prevalent in each of these four categories. And therefore, it has been said that uh, for people with disability, it be horizontal. Okay, so I'm up with my slides here. However, I have a couple of things to state and I think I'll stop my, uh, just sharing the slide here. But um, I'll go back to I'll go back to conclude in a few minutes my this part of the presentation. Um, Okay, uh, I, I should have I should have made um, the slides uh, 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 bringing uh, especially showing you the articles and the statements of the articles. But um, what I want to mention is there is something called the roster. Okay, the roster system. The way we can again get into the dictionary meaning of the roster. But what roster system does is especially I can talk about in employment because um, uh, uh, it is not easy to talk about roster for education all right so in uh, uh, yeah so for in employment there is something called, called the roster which is a best found um, uh, uh, mechanism so far it is not the best fitting but so far for implementing reservation, this is considered to be the best of the options so far. I hope somebody comes up, one of you IITians comes up with a better solution. All right. Now, what Roaster does is, suppose we, uh, okay, now we do, um, all of us know that the, some of these numbers, right? The, it is said that 15% would be reserved for people coming from Shirila, this is the national percentage. 15 for uh, SC, 7.5 for ST, 27% uh, for OBC non creamy layer, okay, 10% EWS category. Now, the EWS will come later because, see, before everything uh, that 50% that, that ceiling um, uh, decision was made, uh, EWS category was not there, okay. So EWS category comes even after that. So the, the EWS would come outside the 50%. Okay. Um, so what happens is um, in order to implement um, the reservation for, and then percentage, which you would have seen, see, um, unless we have, unless there are, um, okay, look at the fraction, 7.5, all right. Uh, we cannot have 7.5 people recruited out of 100, right? And therefore, what you would hear is a 200-point roster. What does that mean? If there are 200 vacancies, then 14 persons can be there. Now, this is simple arithmetic. But how does this, the, how do these 14 people get distributed over 200, okay? Um, so there is a there is a formula um, a number uh, okay which is applied for post based uh, reservation okay post based roster so roster also it me is roster the word roster has come about uh, when it was decided that reservation would be post based okay it would be easier for me to illustrate if i consider the percentage of jharkhand now in jharkhand if some of you have pens you can just write down in jharkhand the uh, reservation for st is 26% okay for sc it is 10% for um, obc uh, there are two sections but uh, uh, both together is 14% so now this way it sums up to 50 all right now so so um if you see, now 50% is reserved. So if I have 100 vacancies, 50% um, is reserved. And so it becomes easy. Now, if the first post is unreserved, the second post needs to be reserved. 
right? So all odd numbered posts are unreserved. So that becomes 50%. And all even numbered posts be reserved. And so how does, now comes the um, task of allocation of the category for which a post number would be earmarked, okay? So, uh, so, so therefore, uh, since here in Jharkhand, it is 26% is for ST and 24% is for the remaining. So therefore, the first reserved post is given to the ST. Okay. And in fact, you, you see, so therefore, um, and now since all of uh, all these numbers, 26, 10, uh, uh, and 14, in 14 also comes as um, um, uh, 8, plus, uh, 8 plus 6. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, should I summarize soon? Okay, all right. So, um, uh, what happens is here, it is also possible to have a 50 point roster because you see, um, these numbers are even numbers, all the numbers are even numbers. So, I mean, even the half would be integer. And even when uh, only when we go to 25 posts, then it becomes uh, a floating point, right? A real number. So then it becomes a problem. So therefore, in Jharkhand, it is a minimum is a 50 point roster, or they have somehow worked out even 11 point roster. What what the, does this mean? In the 11 points, post number one, two, three, four, five, six, up to 11, they're able to allocate. In the, each of the even numbered posts, or they have been e earmarked each of the even numbered posts to to SC to ST to to the two categories. There is there are uh, BC one and BC two. Okay, so both of these two categories they have been able to a lot, and so uh, and since EWS category is also uh, uh, the ten percent, and that has come about. Uh, now in 2019 uh, so recently what has happened is what they've done is given the 10th position out of 100 to the ews category now you'd say that the 10th position also could be to the sa yeah so there are ways to resolve the ties okay so i um, if i had been able to make my slide it would have been easier but i i hope i during the time uh, dr deepak is speaking i'll be able to get those in so that uh, if there are specific questions during the question answer session, I'll be able to answer them. So uh, I think um, it is um, now what I said is if so, once a roster is prepared in an institution, so therefore in uh, employment for teaching as well as non teaching, there is another uh, flavor which comes into the picture in order to reduce the number. You see. When the number is reduced, number of vacancies is reduced, then it becomes not difficult. It becomes impossible also to uh, make uh, uh, have scope or make provision for that representation. For example, if, um, unless in a department there are uh, uh, which is under central government, unless there are fourteen. Uh, in the vacancies or 14 positions, not even one ST because of 7.5 uh, uh, percentage would have a, a scope to be employed under reserved category. Okay, the person, each one of us may have an equal um, uh, claim over the unreserved post, however, but the, we know, and I'm sure from Dr. Deepak's presentation, we are going to see how the, it is never a fair, fair trial, not trial, but a fair race. Okay, and so there are always hurdles after hurdles which make the race. Not difficult, but then it is like no um, uh, um, uh, candidates or applicants coming from socially disadvantaged backgrounds, marginalized backgrounds, scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, and um, uh, non criminal OBCs. Women also have been, um, I mean, outrightly denied, okay, 
because the to, to, to uh, for a long long time i'm sure you would be able to find in the history books as to when was the first girl given admission in civil okay civil engineering so because it was said like no women should not uh, study engineering but coming back to this so what i was saying is okay if the number of vacancies are small let's say less than 14 let's say 13 also there would not be a scope to reserve a place for um uh, uh, for an sd now so since the number becomes crucial and therefore while implementing reservation even at the institution it is said the institution must um, implement reservation policy and fulfill the requirement okay it's a constitutional mandate and must do the, uh, do this and that but what happens is those who are decision makers um, uh, to, to implement in this reservation policy they say okay we'll do it department wise because you know every department must have representation but then it's been seen that the the these segments are made so small that it becomes difficult to implement reservation for example i was when I, um, i was being cited here in uh, my university you know some of the okay it's easy to put and put the blame on uh, those who which are affiliated colleges which are not directly under the control of, of um, um, the university um, so they also some of them may have certain uh, designation and therefore they would have a different um, um they would have freedom from not uh, obliging to certain uh, conditions but reservation for scst is mandatory yet what they would do is they would advertise only one post or two posts okay and there they would say okay we would uh, no this is there are only two posts so where do we um, what is the um, uh, you know uh, uh, 15% of 2 where is uh, what is the 15 uh, of 7.5% of 2 and therefore reservation is not possible all right so and since it is, uh, the 27% is there for obcs so therefore it it has been possible that the third post could be earmarked for obc okay and uh, uh, things like this so you see there have been there have been these tactics of making implementation of the reservation impossible also and so i think it is important for us to uh, either understand the mechanism the tool such as roster um as to how that is being made the roster is being made and then ask the right question in respect of roster if the institute claims that there is post based uh, roster to implement reservation policy but if it is not then we need to devise mechanisms so what happens uh, with in uh, admissions also okay and there again in admission also we we've, we've done we've had our own struggles in jnu to say that reservation is only to be i mean this relaxation is only to be applied to um those who do not make it to let's say now 50% so let's say if we are making a merit list of everybody who is qualified let's say in certain department in uh, iit madras all right so you make a merit list and this 50% needs to be reserved and 50% may not be reserved so whatever is the uh, strength or intake capacity uh, the half of that that is where we need to put the cut off okay so that percent becomes a cut off mark and everybody who is above that cut off mark is it, it should be offered admission without anything as un, as unreserved okay what used to happen even in jnu and uh, you know what the there there were different bins that were created different merit lists which were prepared for those who came from privileged background advantaged background then for scheduled caste then for scheduled tribe and so on and so forth and you know from each of those the the numbers were taken up so even if there was a candidate 
who had scored marks higher than the cutoff mark for the unreserved category would still be given offered admission as, as uh, you know um, under the, uh, the, the quota of that but which was wrong because that was against the spirit of reservation and over a period of time jnu was able to was it was possible for us to educate jnu people and that we got that done um, at least for admission so in admission this is what needs to be observed all those once the merit list is prepared and after that those who qualify as per the cutoff mark their social background does not matter and so so this makes this again brings the spirit of you know um, at least equality there uh, and uh, the, but then unless reservation policy is uh, um, implemented in this fashion the scope for equality the scope for dignity of each person as equal humans and not be viewed by the caste or the family background or the social background uh, um, uh, i mean that would not go and therefore i'm i'm kind of happy that reservation policy does not give the share proportionate to to the percentage of population but the reservation policy which is in india does try to uh, it aspires to um, uh, provide scope for uh, and to achieve equality which is one of the one of the primary pillars and is articulated so well in the preamble of our indian constitution so i think i would stop at this moment i think it would be interesting and it would be good and educational to listen to dr deepak malkam and uh, probably if uh, if i'm able to get my formula up on my um, uh, slide um, and uh, corresponding the questions that may follow later um, i'll be happy to answer Uh, i may not uh, be able to guarantee you the right answer but i may try to attempt to answer the questions thank you so much for this opportunity uh, and hats off to you guys the organizers of uh, this evening's meeting um, and thank you so much i mean before i begin iits and iims really represent a very tiny sliver of higher education landscape in this country right but for both good and for bad they are more often than not the norm makers the bellwethers so we might as well pay attention to what is happening uh, at these institutions not that they uh, constitute uh, any significant part of the higher education landscape but simply because uh, they are test beds for what might later be uh, exported uh, so to speak uh, to other parts of the uh, higher education uh, ecosystem uh let me i have i really have only two slides so uh let me uh share my screen uh just to throw some numbers at you in the last 4 to 5 years a number of curious students like you have tried to uh, like you at apsc have tried to develop a numbers portrait if you will of what it really looks like at these institutions iits and uh, iims uh, this is from uh, my friend and collaborator dr siddharth joshi uh, a graduate of uh, both iit bombay and iim uh, bangalore uh, he started doing this Uh, while he was a graduate student at uh, IIM uh, Bangalore, uh, was amongst the first to effectively use the RTI mechanism to get administrative data on social composition of faculty bodies at IITs, IIMs, etc. Uh, I mean, until about five years ago, we didn't even really know what this composition actually uh, looked like. Thanks to the efforts of uh people like you uh, we have these numbers and uh, these numbers are uh, routinely put out in the media as well the media reports on these numbers on a regular basis using information uh, gathered by uh, students mostly uh, around uh, the country so these headlines actually 
uh, speak for themselves. Diversity deficit at IIMs, IITs, just 23 STs and 157 SCs uh, from nearly uh, 10,000 uh, faculty members at IITs. Uh, I mean, IIMs actually the proportion is even uh, worse. Here is a quick snapshot. I've taken this from a uh, recent uh, news report. This is from 2019. Well, just to give you a sense that things haven't really changed, what you see at the center is what uh, Siddharth obtained in 2016 uh, across different IITs. But let's focus on the two uh, blue bars at either end of the screen. Right. So on your left, you have the numbers for uh, IIT. Right? There, there's a huge chunk that is uh, un, unfilled. Right? And people, they, they haven't found, uh, uh, they haven't been able to fill faculty positions uh, for a significant chunk. So if you uh, remove that out, right? I mean, you see that across the entire IIT system, you have only 149 uh, SC faculty members and 21 ST. Uh, faculty members and and this problem is actually more acute in the older well established uh, iits if you move to the right of my uh, screen uh, gives you a very similar breakup for uh, iims uh, the problem here is even more acute across the entire 20 uh, iim system there are only 8 uh, sc faculty members and 2 uh, ST faculty members and 27 uh, OBC uh, faculty Dr. members. Deepak, yes. Deepak, I'm sorry to just uh, stop you here, but uh, it looks like you're still on the first slide or uh, what is it? You're, you're quoting some numbers and. and um, well, at least on my screen, I see. Do you, do you see a slide with uh, three I bands? I see the print. That's that's a slide that. I yes. Uh, so so I'm 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 quoting these numbers from uh, the right hand side. I mean, are you able to see the cursor that I'm moving uh, around the pie chart? No. No, we don't see a pie chart. No. Oh, you don't see a pie chart. Yes. Wow. Okay. We are, we are on the page which says the print and the wire. Oh wow. Okay, I have actually. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, let me see if I can uh, yeah. do this. I'm, I mean, I really it. apologize. I have no idea. Just try doing page up. Well, no, no, no. I mean, I can see it on my on my screen. So let me uh, try and open a. Uh, uh, let me stop this presentation and open a PDF version and see if that will work better. Are you able to see the numbers now? I, I oh, apologize. Yes. 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 Okay. I I'm 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 really sorry. I have no idea. Uh, I mean, at at I am we uh, take great pride in being quote unquote leaders in digital education. So there you go. Uh, all right. Uh, so let me actually walk through the slide uh, again, uh, given that. Uh, you weren't able to actually uh, see what's on the slide. So I started with these. These are recent numbers uh, from that print article uh, that you were uh, seeing. But really, uh, the print and all other news media outlets really gather this information from various students across uh, India who've been filing relentlessly filing uh, right to information uh, requests at the uh, government and at individual institutions to try and collate this data just to give you a sense that things have not changed in the middle you have numbers obtained by my collaborator uh, Siddharth in 2016 and the two blue bands that you see on either end of the screen are from 2019 so uh, things haven't uh, changed a whole lot 
uh, for IITs, which is at the left uh, edge of your screen, uh, across the entire IIT uh, system, and, 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 and these numbers are from the uh, 10 uh, reasonably uh, well-established uh, IITs, uh, you, you have uh, only 21 ST faculty members and 149 SC faculty members. This number is actually even more stark uh, when you uh, go over uh, to IMs on the right side of your screen, right? Where you see that across the uh, IIM uh, system, there are only two ST faculty members and eight SC faculty members. I mean, if, I mean, if, if you can even see uh, those lines in the uh, pie chart and just 27 uh, OBC uh, faculty uh, members, right? I mean, for example, in the uh, uh, institution where I work at IIM uh, Bangalore, out of 108 faculty members, there are 106 uh, uh, quote-unquote upper caste uh, faculty members and uh, there are uh, two OBCs and there is one uh, uh, SC uh, faculty member on our uh, institution's role. So uh, that, that should give you a uh, sense of where we are actually uh, coming from. Right? This is indeed a, uh, a bleak uh, picture. Uh, let me turn this off. I have no more uh, slides to actually uh, present. Uh, let's make sure we, act, we are actually accurately characterizing the empirical picture here. The pictures that you saw on the screen uh, actually massively understate the real social diversity deficit. For example, the aggregate quote unquote general hides the fact that I, at IIMs, about 90% of the faculty members are drawn from just two social groups. No prizes for guessing the group identities. I will argue in a little bit later that it is actually important to unmask the caste-less claims of these uh, elite groups. Yes, about 90% of the faculty body at IIM is drawn from Brahmin and Kais groups. That together do not account for more than 7 to 8% of the total population of India, and that's uh, being uh, generous. Right, so the snapshot that you have is about 90% of uh, IIM faculty body is drawn from just two uh, social groups accounting for about 7% of India. Right. So that, 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 that's really where we are uh, starting from. What this picture describes can be termed only as an Indian apartheid. Right? The problem at Indian institutions is actually more acute than South African institutions in the mid-1990s. And that is saying something. We do not have an American-style minority inclusion problem. We have a South African-style majority exclusion problem. And, and it's, it's, it's very uh, important to be clear that these are two, while, while somewhat related, are two very different kinds of uh, questions to uh, confront. Right? Minority exclusion is very different from uh, majority uh, exclusion. Of course, we are focused on higher education institutions this evening and uh, IITs slash IIMs in particular, at least uh, during the course of my uh, presentation. But I can throw out very similar numbers for other parts of our society. Higher echelons of the judiciary, bureaucracy, media, cinema, even higher echelons of the armed forces. And of course, an entirely different matter that the rank and file uh, of the army like any all volunteer army is recruited predominantly from the uh, historically marginalized uh, social groups or really even the parliament right i mean when when the example that i most often use in speaking about reservations with my students is to simply look at the parliament and compare and contrast the uh, Lok Sabha with the Rajya Sabha. As all of you know, uh, there are constitutionally mandated quotas in Lok Sabha, whereas there are no such uh, mandated quotas in the upper house or the Rajya Sabha. 
and for obvious reasons, I mean, I, we don't have to uh, go into uh, how MPs are elected to uh, Rajya Sabha and why it's not possible to do uh, quotas with uh, biennial uh, elections, uh, etc. We'll, we'll come back to uh, this when we uh, discuss the very important point that uh, Professor Mins made about uh, the roster system, uh, etc. But nonetheless, I mean, just to throw out some numbers from my own home state of uh, Karnataka, uh, in the last 60 years, uh, there have been only two uh, Dalit members in the Rajya Sabha from Karnataka, right? I mean, so because there are no reservations. Uh, to uh, Rajya Sabha. So when you, you, you get a picture absent uh, reservations, uh, this is what you end up with. And the IAM, the bleak IAM picture that you see is largely a product of very willful uh, default of reservation provisions for a number of years. I'll, I'll, I'll get into that in uh, just a, a little bit. But even within uh, the higher education system, and, and to uh, borrow on uh, the uh, very important point made by Professor Mintz, my favorite example is the CSIR institutions located right across the road from uh, IIT Madras. I'm talking about the CLRI or the Central Leather Research uh, Institute. I leave it to you as a homework to all, all of you from IIT Madras uh, for you to enumerate the social backgrounds of scientists working at uh, CLRI, right? I mean, do your CLRI exercise and reflect on that really blinding insight from Baba Sahib Ambedkar, right? I mean, we are not talking about division of uh, labor, but we are talking about division of laborers, right? And, 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 and we need to reflect on why at a leather technology institute, right? I mean, when, you, you have the social composition that you actually see at uh, CLRI. Right? So what happens when uh, leather technology becomes uh, professionalized, becomes uh, Brahminized, uh, if you will? Why is it that professionalization of uh, occupation goes hand in hand with also Brahminization of uh, these uh, occupations? Well, I'll try and review some of the key debates around uh, reservation. It is important that we keep this context in mind. The, these numbers, the stark numbers are important. Indeed, I would argue that given the snapshot, we need an entirely new vocabulary that goes beyond reservation, inclusion, diversity, quotas, et cetera, a vocabulary that can begin to grapple with exclusion head on. For long, we've used polite terms and I've, uh, I'm at least as guilty as anybody else, such as inclusion, diversity, et cetera. The real problem that we are faced with is massive exclusion. Right? I mean, I'll, I'll try and uh, give you anecdotal instances of how this act exclusion actually plays out in uh, real uh, everyday uh, life on these uh, elite uh, institutions. Uh, as we are exploring the uh, relationship between reservations and caste justice, that's the title of this evening's uh, seminar, uh, I want to begin by recounting my own tryst, very personal tryst with uh, reservation. Right? And, 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 and in uh, uh, really picking up from where Professor uh, Menz left us with, first and foremost, of course, my lottery of birth. That's easily understood. Right? I mean, the accumulated privilege that I inherited at birth as being a male uh, Brahmin with a father who had a secure uh, public sector job. This, by the way, is the life trajectory uh, of uh, a very large proportion of IIT and IIM uh, faculty colleagues is real reservation. Right. So and then it has been baked into our social structure over hundreds of years. I can rebel against Brahminical structures, but I remain unscathed as a Brahmin. Right? I, can, I can be a father to an Adivasi girl, but I will continue to be a Brahmin. Right? And conversely, my daughter will never be one. Right? I do not want to hurt my incredible uh, host here, uh, but it's a fact that reservation at birth also explains why I am speaking here this evening. I've been invited largely because I've played a very minor supporting role in highlighting social diversity deficit at IIMs, 
the main actors are actually not here. The prime movers behind the ongoing effort at IIMs are a bunch of incredible Dalit alumni from these institutions. They have done all the heavy lifting, including legally challenging these mighty institutions, often at enormous personal cost. Right? My collaborator Siddharth and I tried to keep the spotlight uh, on where the vanguard really begin, belongs, pardon me, but uh, quite evidently, we do not always uh, succeed. I want to, however, fo uh, focus on a more quote unquote real reservation, and of course, uh, not unrelated to the uh, birth lottery that I won at the time of my uh, conception, that is seldom recognized as being reservation by so many of my uh, Brahmin colleagues at IIMs or IITs. Apparently, even Supreme Court justices promoting uh, Dalits against reservations do not get it. My professional trajectory was largely defined by my graduate school experience. Like so many IIT Madras or IIM Bangalore colleagues, I studied at fine American uh, institutions. It does not take a genius to figure out that my graduate school admission was largely predicated on the generous affirmative action and diversity policies at the two institutions that I attended. I distinctly remember that like every other Brahmin graduate school applicant from India, I made a case for how I will uniquely add to the diversity of the classroom at Princeton. Right? I mean, that, that, that's the reason I got into uh, uh, graduate school at Princeton. Uh, at graduate school, I of course, uh, once I got there, of course, I waxed eloquent about how unrepresentative uh, Indians at Princeton or any other uh, elite Western uh, institutions are. Uh, that still continues to be the case in this uh, generation. I apologize for belaboring on with my personal account, but my own autobiographical thumbnail sketch is representative of how merit is constructed and how it operates and and did not want this actually to be an academic talk so i thought i'd begin with uh, a, a personal uh, anecdote i hope however that i've been able to convince you that we are not actually debating reservation in the absolute most broadly conceived as was uh, uh, pointed out uh, so well by uh, Professor Mins, but we are actually only talking about a particular form of reservation, one related to ascriptive identity such as caste. Right, the principal normative objection uh, to group-based reservation, and, and, and the reason why uh, you see this dismal uh, uh, position at I am Bangalore. I'm not even going to, uh, for this audience, deal with uh, the usual uh, canards around how meritocracy operates or how uh, uh, merit operates, etc. But instead, actually take on one possibly plausibly uh, serious objection, but that objection also actually comes from a very flawed understanding of the constructivist arguments in uh, social sciences. Right? Liberal opponents of using caste as a legitimate uh, diversity uh, marker argue that any form of caste-based affirmative action only undermines their project of transcending, if not, they would claim even annihilating caste completely erasing caste because by doing caste-based reservations, you're giving new oxygen uh, to uh, the institution of caste, or at least that is the uh, argument. Right, and, and, and uh, this is an argument uh, that has actually been debunked within the social sciences, actually quite a bit. I mean, I, I don't want to uh, spend a lot of time uh, this evening uh, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd point out to uh, a couple of my own articles uh, where uh, I've discussed this in uh, some uh, detail. Uh, but what I uh, really want to uh, talk about here is if caste is a social construction, merit is even more a social construction. Right? I mean, the real problem in the room is not caste being a socially constructed category, uh, but merit being a socially constructed category. And let me uh, give you uh, some 
real uh, examples of how this operates within elite uh, technical education spaces, be it IITs, IIMs, etc. Let me begin with IIM, the institutional setting that uh, I am most uh, familiar with. Uh, like all major research uh, universities, uh, IIMs are both quote unquote producers and consumers of faculty talent. Right? Indeed, as we speak, roughly about 40% of all IIM faculty members across the 20 uh, campus system across the country uh, have a PhD from within the IIM system. What this means is uh, about 40% of uh, current faculty members at IIM were trained to be a faculty within the system. Right? So the usual uh, uh, canard that we just don't have faculty talent uh, and therefore uh, what do we do with uh, reservation simply does not hold. Right? I mean, just step one step back and ask the question, what were you doing in your PhD program? For, uh, for 50 years now, IAMs have very willfully uh, willfully violated uh, constitutionally and uh, statutory mandates on reservations within uh, the uh, PhD program, which until very recently at IIM was called as the fellow program in management. And, and this, this is the uh, root cause, if you will, of why you have this dismal picture at uh, I am. The IIT story is not very different. I'll, I'll, I'll return to the IIT story in just a, a little bit. Uh, I mean, let me give you uh, the pristine version of the story uh, as it played out in uh, IIMs. Uh, and it, it, it ties very well with uh, what Professor Mind was talking about the uh, roster system. The primary mechanism through which uh, IIMs were able to get away uh, without uh, reserving uh, seats in the PhD program is something Siddharth and I have called the null matrix argument. Right? We are both engineers, so apologies to uh, all the uh, non-engineers in the uh, room. So what is the uh, null matrix argument? Well, you want us to reserve 27%, uh, 50%, uh, 12 and a half percent, whatever percent of seats for uh, certain categories, that assumes that we actually know what the denominator is. I mean, I can calculate X percent of something only if I know what that something is. Right? So the uh, biggest trick that uh, IAMs have used uh, historically is to keep this base completely undefined. Right? I mean, thanks to uh, relentless uh, RTI efforts from uh, Siddharth, we actually have been able to even discern a pattern here. Right? So one year you admit 20 students, the next year you admit 30 students, the next year 23. But obviously you're operating within a uh, narrow band. Right? Even internally, obviously, these institutions have always had a defined uh, number of uh, positions that are available in the uh, PhD program, uh, but their primary strategy to avoid reservations has been uh, to leave the actual base undefined. Right? I mean, it's 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 a null matrix. You can't you can't define a category matrix because uh, there doesn't exist a base. Right? I mean, that, and 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 this is uh, an argument that has gone on for uh, half a century. Uh, some enlightened uh, uh, alumni from uh, IIMs uh, have taken uh, the lead institution uh, uh, which pioneered uh, the null matrix uh, argument to, uh, uh, to the court uh, at Ahmedabad. It, the case is actually pending in the uh, Ahmedabad uh, High Court as we uh, speak. Uh, but this is a specious argument. I mean, how do you even uh, uh, begin to react to uh, this uh, sort of an argument, right? And there really is no defense of the uh, null matrix uh, argument. So what this has done 
is this is what has resulted in what we have called missing scholars. Right, writing in the early 1990s, uh, the Nobel laureate Indian economist Amartya Sen uh, coined the influential term missing women to describe lo lower than biologically expected sex ratios as a result of sun preference leading to sex selective abortions, female infanticide, uh, etc. The half a century of record of commissions and uh, omissions, mostly commissions at IIM's doctoral program is akin to the cultural prejudices that leads to missing women. This deliberate circumvention of constitutional and statutory provisions by IIM's has led to what we term the missing scholars. Right? IIM's uh, that have graduated a significant number of uh, doctoral uh, cohorts. If you, if you did a simple uh, counting, uh, we estimate that the quantum of missing scholars represents at least 130%, that's not a mistake, 130% of total IIM trained faculty members. And that's the quantum of missing scholars. If in the last 50 years, we had paid attention to our PhD program, we would have actually uh, had no problem. I mean, I mean, at least the specious argument of, uh, well, we don't find anybody suitable uh, to be a faculty member at these uh, uh, institutions uh, is, is, is really a bogus one. I mean, it's, it's entirely a result of a series of errors of commission at uh, these very uh, institutions, right? Uh, more recently, after uh, uh, after, uh, thanks to uh, the enormous pressure uh, applied on the government uh, by uh, former alumni from uh, these uh, institutions, uh, the government's actually uh, mandated uh, reservation in the uh, PhD uh, program. So what do these, how did these institutions respond? A, a few months ago, actually at the beginning of this year, uh, they shot off a letter uh, to uh, the government saying, well, uh, we should be uh, absolved of all uh, reservation provisions for uh, faculty uh, positions uh, because we are really highly specialized uh, institutions. Uh, we aspire to be uh, an uh, institution of excellence, eminence, uh, uh, what have you. Right. So, this is an ongoing uh, struggle. So, I mean, unlike uh, the snapshot presented by uh, Professor Menz, at these elite institutions, uh, what, what we are doing is to try and get the institutions to even recognize that they as a public institution, and, and I'll come to this in just a little bit. A, an underlying crisis is the dilution of the social contract. It's not entirely clear that the powers that be at IITs and IIMs actually see themselves as public institutions, right? And, 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 and public institutions come with a uh, social contract, uh, which these institutions have been in violation for a number of uh, decades uh, now. That the implicit social contract is between a uh, public university and the society at large. But public universities are being bled to death. I mean, just like uh, IIMs have been at uh, uh, fun fully intended, uh, the bleeding edge of this uh, bloodbath, if you will. Right? I mean, this is where uh, uh, strategies to bleed out the uh, public institutions have been uh, perfected. Right? So how do we uh, actually uh, confront uh, this uh, problem? And, 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 and these, these, these are problems that have very real consequences uh, for uh, students studying uh, in these uh, institutions. For one, they don't have any uh, role models. Right? I mean, on the other side of the uh, lecture, I mean, I mean uh, IAMs, uh, thanks to enormous uh, public pressure, uh, 
uh, and I am went through some of the problems that uh, Professor Mins talked about at uh, JNU in terms of how to operationalize uh, quotas, etc. In our uh, mainstream uh, MBA uh, program, uh, we we actually admit a very diverse class into our uh, MBA program, but these are students that barely have a role model on the uh, faculty. And anyway, there's nobody that uh, looks like them. There's nobody that uh, speaks like them. There's nobody that shares their uh, life experiences. And that is a, a serious problem in terms of how uh, these campuses are organized. And, and I, can, I, can, I can give you a very uh, a personal example from uh, two years ago. Uh, just to give you a sense and also to uh, uh, also in response to uh, uh, critiques who claim, well, caste is actually uh, some archaic phenomena uh, that uh, doesn't live anymore in uh, urban centers or uh, certainly not on uh, elite uh, campuses. Actually, caste has been transformed, but older institutional structures uh, continue to uh, thrive as well. Right. So two years ago, I uh, underwent a long uh, disciplinary uh, hearing at uh, IIM Bangalore uh, because I objected to uh, a senior faculty member uh, sending out a, a email uh, every year uh, uh, with uh, the email uh, trail reading in bold lines for Brahmins only, right? And this was an email about quote unquote sacred thread changing ceremony that is held uh, every year. And, and, and I said, well, this should have uh, no uh, uh, a place in a, a secular public institution. And this faculty member was offended. Uh, he filed a complaint against me that I was harassing him and that I was uh, stopping him from uh, practicing his uh, religion, so on and uh, so forth. And I actually served a one year uh, punishment that was meted out to me uh, uh, after uh, several uh, internal uh, reviews. Right, so Brahminism is very much alive and kicking in these institutions. I mean, there are consequences to 90% of the faculty body being drawn from uh, two uh, social groups. Right? I mean, there, there are real uh, consequences. And, 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 my, and I, I really got away very lightly. And students belonging to uh, uh, marginalized uh, groups uh, go through hell. Right? I mean, I mean, when, when, uh, I mean, when to uh, give you a sense of uh, how this works, uh, I can do no better than uh, try and uh, paraphrase uh, the great American uh, writer, uh, Tony Morrison, the Nobel Prize winner, uh, Tony uh, Morrison, uh, talking about how racism uh, works on uh, campuses and why uh, it is important. Uh, she said the function, she said, and I'm quoting here, the very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your very reason for being. And, 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 and given the uh, atmosphere uh, at these uh, institutions, uh, this is exactly how uh, students from historically uh, marginalized uh, groups uh, pair at an IIT or an IIM. So where do we uh, go from uh, here? Uh, a bunch of us have uh, for long argued that it's important that we bring back the R word into this debate. There really cannot be, when, when this evening's uh, seminar was reservations and justice, there really cannot be any justice without a conversation about reparations, right? I mean, these institutions owe a reparation to uh, Indian society at large, right? For willfully and oftentimes skillfully, deceitfully 
uh, skirting uh, constitutionally mandated uh, reservation provisions for a uh, number of uh, years. And, and I think it's important that uh, we actually bring to bear the reparation uh, argument on these uh, institutions. The reparation uh, doesn't have to be material. It's a moral reparation uh, that these institutions owe uh, to uh, the larger uh, society as uh, public uh, institutions. Well, all of this is, of course, uh, easier uh, said uh, than uh, uh, done, right? A practical program of reparation must, of course, grapple with the contentious question beyond the apathy and indifference that produced uh, these missing scholars in the first place. The most contentious of these goals relates to the central goals of reservation or affirmative action. Reservation programs at Indian Institutes of Management or Indian Institutes of Technology are often mischaracterized as a redistribution policy, sometimes even thought of as a welfare program a uh, poverty alleviation program. Affirmative action programs here in India or anywhere else in the world are not meant to tweak the co social composition, are, 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 are also not meant to tweak the social composition of elite institutions to exactly mirror the demography of the society. That's right? a point that uh, Professor Mins uh, made as well. Affirmative action at elite institutions recognizes that such institutions are norm makers and social diversity only adds to the social legitimacy of institutions, especially at public institutions like IIMs or IITs. The relentless erosion of social contract between a public institution and society of, at large is in the ultimate analysis, the principal driver of the missing scholars conundrum that uh, I've been uh, laying out uh, here. Any attempt to redress the problem must begin by renewing and perhaps even reinventing the social contract that puts diversity, justice, uh, etc. at the core of how uh, these institutions uh, operate. But surely uh, institutional autonomy is central to academic excellence because autonomy is a, a often used argument to skirt constitutionally uh, mandated reservations. We need autonomy uh, to uh, 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 be uh, independent, to grow, to excel, uh, so on and uh, so forth. Right, so islands of excellence within the IAM system have indeed been fueled by great flexibility and autonomy that is conspicuously absent in the vast majority of Indian institutions. And indeed, this is the reason why uh, IITs and IIMs uh, uh, at some apparent level have done well. However, alongside this modest academic excellence, IIMs and IITs have also clamored for an autonomy that is not subject to searching social scrutiny beyond statutorily mandated fiscal audits. Such claims have hinged on financial independence that is in turn predicated on turning students at public institutions into customers paying for private services. The reason why IIMs are able to be financially independent and autonomous is because our students pay uh, ridiculous uh, tuition fees. I mean, as I speak, uh, the MBA tuition at uh, IIM, uh, or at least the older IIM, is close to 3 million rupees. That's uh, 30 lakh rupees for a uh, two-year course. Right. I mean, I mean, I mean, when, when, when you're doing this, you're no longer talking about a social contract between a student and a professor, right? By reducing a student to fee paying customers, we are reducing the professoriate to being a, a customer service uh, provider guild as well, right? So these are intermeshed problems. You really cannot begin to address uh, problems with uh, reservations or lack of reservations at elite uh, technical institutions in India without first also recovering the social contract of these institutions as public institutions. Unless we uh, actually forcefully recognize that these are public institutions built with public resources uh, working for 
uh, quote unquote public uh, at large, it's impossible to uh, even begin uh, having uh, these uh, conversations. Why don't I actually stop here? I mean, I had a couple of other points to make, but I know uh, we've already uh, exceeded our uh, time here. Uh, I think we should uh, open this up uh, for q and A. I'm happy to uh, uh, hear from you, learn from you, and uh, uh, if there's anything uh, I can answer uh, questions related to IITs and I am, uh, I'm happy to uh, do that as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, APSC, again, uh, for having me on this panel. So, yeah, audience, I think uh, people can just uh, put a message in the chat box. Either we can uh, read the question to the speaker. So, Adit so, Aditya N has actually put a question. Aditya, can you just unmute yourself and ask the question yourself? Aditya? Yeah. Uh, hello, Professor uh, Malgan. Uh, your personal anecdote was really shocking. Um, uh, if you are okay with sharing, uh, what was, I'm curious to know, what was the reasoning behind uh, punishing you rather than the person who sent out the email that was exclusionary, it was it excluded on the basis of caste. So what was the reasoning that they followed to punish you? Well, I mean, I guess that the, I mean, the subtext is uh, these are uh, Brahmin institutions. I mean, I think, I mean, I think let's not uh, mince words. Uh, I mean, I mean that, 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 that's uh, really uh, where this was uh, coming from. Uh, I mean, let's, I mean, I, mean, I think, I mean, I, we can, we can obviously uh, chat about this. I'm happy to chat about this, but probably we should not use up uh, public seminar time to, I mean, I, I mean, I don't want to uh, be uh, uh, sort of crying in public saying, oh, well, this happened to me. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean at the time this happened, I was a tenured faculty member. Right, so uh, I mean, all they could do was uh, uh, withhold my uh, research budget for a year or so, uh, but nothing more. Uh, the real uh, question here is, uh, what does this mean uh, for uh, somebody who might actually be impacted? And, 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 and there are uh, there are other instances where uh, students from uh, historically. Uh, marginalized social group have actually been uh, impacted, targeted, etc. I mean, those, those are those are even more serious than uh, something of this sort. Uh, I, I mean, a short answer to your question is uh, the system was very uh, angry with a bunch of us uh, pushing for uh, uh, reservations uh, within the IAM system, specifically the uh, PhD program. I mean, that that's that's the uh, subtext. I mean, when everything else is. Uh, a matter of detail. Uh, I'm not able to hear if somebody is speaking. Okay. So, yeah, I think next Preeti has a question. Uh, Ms. Preeti, are you here? Can you just raise your question yourself? Unmute and raise your question yourself. Hello? Ms. Preeti, hello? Uh, so, Kausik. Uh, yeah. Hi. Good evening. Uh, good evening and namaste. I am from Nepal exactly. I am from Tiruvan University. And I am feeling myself very privileged uh, to participate in this webinar. If Professor Minja has already left, I don't know, but I see Professor uh, Malgan here and I listened to him. It, it was very interesting. Uh, sir, I think you are quite familiar with Nepal situation. Nepal has gone through uh, a wrong, long political uh, changes, and since 2006, uh, the country has, from a monarchy, the country has become a republic, republic, and the discourse in the country is very high. Getting this reservation, quota, affirmative action. Yeah, ma'am is also there. 
to happy to learn from your experience in fact uh, the indian experience because the discourse in india has been since a long say since the day the constitution was drafted until today the discourse is going on and nepal got a constitution in 2015 only a republican constitution and the discourse is very high though the country is small population less than 3 crore but there are more than 125 caste and ethnic groups and the issue is taking a a pace and in between there are some confusion some conflict may not be a war but but people are having some type of tension so i would love to have your tension in fact how a new country like nepal new in the sense democratic or federal democratic republic is a new in this practice what lessons should we really learn so that we can have a better society in the near future thank you both uh, sir and ma'am both you can uh, address my queries if you like it thank you professor men do you want to go uh, um yeah, uh, dr upadhyay um i'm kind of um, not very confident as to how to respond to your question because i i think neither of us are really the social scientists so have uh, but at least i'm not a trained social scientist and not need, nor have i at all uh, dealt with any of such studies however um i think um, partly since i've read preeti's question but what i would like to mention uh, i can at least recount history of at least you know 30 30 30 40 years okay i think even in the city like delhi delhi university and jnu i can tell you that or i can recollect and give you instances how just because of reservation the presence of um, uh, you know it was possible for students to come and join be present just the presence of a person has managed to bring about the first sensibility in people who have been colleagues or uh, you know uh, classmates um, i can tell you in 1986 this is what was done to one of uh, the friends i knew and who had taken admission in the delhi university he he told us that uh, the teacher came to the class and said all those of you who have come under quota stand up okay and they had to stand of course like no you can't even lie so okay they, they stood but what does that mean which means uh, again as freethi had mentioned whether again further um, uh, um, students and others are open to discrimination of course yes i mean earlier before entering institutions you are there in a the larger uh, you know let's say swimming in the ocean but here you get identified in a smaller pool okay so you get identified now the, the other thing i have learned over a period of time you know our system or caste system is not only to do with uh, we it doesn't only have a bearing on uh, you know um, your genetic genetic makeup but there are other ways in which individuals can be identified one of them is name the other is the features i mean if uh, some of you have uh, you know interacted with people from uh, you know jharkhand and this uh, mainland or mid um, uh, yeah central india tribal half men and anybody who's been this night would take a look at me and would know where i come from and because of my features i am easily identified that i am just a second uh, yeah i mean there was a, the voice was not coming through smoothly so now i think you can like there was a mic on okay, yeah kaushik's yeah. my uh, thing was not yeah, muted yeah. Yeah, yeah, now we can. Yeah. So, so what I was saying is, um, you know, I can at least uh, recount and I can tell things about instances about you know, thirty-six years of my experience um, um, uh, in um, Delhi University as well as JNU. Is what I was also. I don't know whether I'll be able to respond to Dr. Upadhyay's uh, point, but then what I was trying to say. Because of um, reservation policies implemented, if earlier 
law fully uh, but then that made uh, provision for people to come to the spaces okay college and universities it all began with very 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 bad experiences but over a period of time uh, it uh, uh, the classmates and the colleagues have become a little more sensible they have been observing people they have been seeing the resilience as well as you know the if they thought there was no merit in people like me <laughs> at least there has been instances that they were wrong and also as i was trying to recollect um, uh, the instance of how in delhi university they would ask students who had got admission through quota to stand up okay so there have been very very ugly scenarios but you know it the 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 the, the uh, these educational institutions have come a long way the, there has been a change in the vocabulary there is there has been through bad experiences probably but there has been uh, a lot of um, I mean, I'm not so grateful for the kind of um, uh, um, uh, wisdom they have acquired, but at least, you know, in the presence of people like me and my colleagues who come from marginalized section, the conversations or the vocabulary used is not so blatant, okay, and not, not so judgmental and not so condemning. And so I think, uh, however, but however harsh and however i mean a brutal the beginning be uh, unless these realities are also bring brought to the fore i think we would not be able to overcome uh, and i mean uh, and so uh, what i was trying to remember also um, when I was the chief advisor of Equal Opportunity Office in JNU, I was trying to tell you, um, in, uh, recollect how I learned that, you know, it's not only your genetic makeup or once your DNA test is done that you may be identified as belonging to the caste X or Y, but also the names, the way naming is done. And therefore, I on one uh, on one, this account, I salute Periyar's movement where the surnames had uh, were dropped, or there was a call for dropping the surname, so that from the surname, one's caste identity was not identifiable. Okay, but then that becomes a, a dilemma, and that becomes a um, uh, thing for a, a tussle, or uh, not very very appropriate for scheduled tribes, because it is by the tribe name can we and with other it is name plus other uh, features that we can assert that i belong to a scheduled tribe okay so just dropping the name is not a, an option that that must have been for at a certain point of time at that time it seemed appropriate and it has done its good but then we i mean we are a country of such a diversity that not one policy can be uniformly applied because we are diverse and there is no homo homogeneous condition. So, but then, um, yeah, so I, uh, what I wanted to mention is um, to uh, uh, Dr. Upadhi, I, I have no experience of uh, Nepal except telling you I come from an Urao um, uh, uh, tribe. I, you have Uraos in Nepal, you have Santals in Nepal. I'm sitting in Santal Pargana. So, uh, you know, it, uh, these are the tribes which are also pre present besides other tribes from uh, Nepal. But uh, I think the provisions, if there are being made in the constitution, I think they need to be deliberated. Some way forward for implementations have to be initiated. Otherwise, uh, you know, equality and equity and even dignity of uh, other person as human is not achievable, in my opinion. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Menzai. Uh, I have no particular expertise on Nepal, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do it. thank you. So, ma'am, there is one more question uh, by a person called Titi. So, reservation policies ensure the equity and social justice principles 
from constitutional rights. But it has been observed that marginalized sections, after entering the academic spaces, are subject to discrimination humiliated a lot. Dr. Payal, Dr. Payal, Ravi Timla, and so many other cases that remain noticed are examples of what we call institutional murders. In that case, are reservation policies really doing the justice? What is the way forward? I thought I tried to touch upon this. Yes, I did say that reservation policy in whichever flawful form it was implemented way back in 80s or even 70s in limited form, especially uh, uh, yeah, in uh, admission and uh, it was not uh, implemented. Look at the, should I use the word mindset or the attitude? Okay, the decision to um, have reservation in teaching positions in universities was made uh, by uh, at whichever highest level and etc. But was to be implemented through UGC in this decision was made in 1986. But even, oh no, 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 before that. JNU had decided to implement it in 1986. That was a year of decision. But when it actually got implemented, it was 1996. Okay. So it took 10 years for JNU, given the kind of uh, environment JNU is, to also deal with this matter that, you know, scheduled tribes and scheduled castes be given reservation at teaching positions and at the entry level assistant professor. So can you think of other places how it would be? Now, that is one. But then second, yes. Um, so therefore, the, in the flawful way, it was implemented, the reservation was implemented uh, uh, in education, okay? And there had been instances similar to um, uh, Dr. Payal and uh, Rohit Vimula. We've had, if you visit the cases of suicides in Ames, none of them were not scheduled tribe or scheduled caste, okay? They were each of them. They pick up the data from uh, suicides of Ames. They, they were all. Uh, they all came from either the uh, scheduled caste background or scheduled tribe. Okay. The only thing is, in these institutions, there were there was wasn't so much of support. Okay, of people who could take up the matter. So we have been having the the in episodes of uh, Dr. Uh, Payal and uh, Rohit Vimula even earlier. It is just that it, it took so long for this matter to come up and to be talked about and it took the form of movement and became a national issue only after um, uh, late Rohit Vimula's uh, uh, unfortunate uh, end, uh, end of life. Okay, so but then the thing is you know, it's been going on. There have been similar cases even earlier, but how many times has uh, or how many we should see the percentage of students who entered percentage of students who gave up percentage of students who dropped out and percentage of students who under such extreme situations also completed and got their degree and left the institution so i think we need to see how the minimization and optimization problem therefore buddies okay so how to minimize the first and the second and maximize the third uh, outcome that I was talking about. So therefore, discussions such as this one, you know, in IIT Madras, you know, way back in 1986, I did uh, write the entrance exam uh, for applied mathematics of IIT Madras. And I did also wish that I didn't make it. <laughs> because I did by then know the, what the environment of uh, IITs was like. Um, no, no, it was not 86, in 84, okay, um, for my MSc. But you see, so therefore, like, no, in spite of reservation, there has, it has been known as to how certain institutions are open or totally oppressive. And therefore, you know, um, there would be students uh, such as me way back in 1984 who would want to and also not want to pursue higher education in those institutions. But then I think, I mean, the survivors, the number, we need to optimize the number of survivors so that that would give courage and motivation 
for those who are coming behind us who, who, who have been born later would try to strengthen themselves and uh, you know uh, put up a good fight support groups in uh, campuses such as yours unless they exist i think we'll not be able to maximize the outcome of the third group that i talked about right those who completed degree and also i think the the the, the conversations i think it also requires the the environment we come from to be sensitized to be encouraging so that even whatever um, one may be facing as a student in the institution unless this i mean sometimes this is what i don't know whether we should uh, blame the kind of uh, the times that indian middle class are faced with that you know if the bacha has got admission in iit and needs to complete and needs to exit i mean there's such pressures cannot be coming from the family too so there is a lot of and all facets and therefore i think education today needs to be discussed not only with students and teachers but also parents this third with all the three components needs to come together to be able to you know um uh, not not address but at least deliberate on things we talking about uh, such issues and cases of discrimination or special instances of discrimination will not be eliminated unless they are talked about and discussed and brought out in the conversation and in debates and discourses in the campuses but it is possible to overcome So th thank you, ma'am. I think Shrihari uh, Shrihari had a point to make. I think Shrihari, are you there? Uh, uh, Shrihari wanted to make. Kaushik. Hello. Kaushik, one second. Yeah. Yeah. Me. Like while Shrihari gets ready, uh, like I got a question uh, through WhatsApp. Like, uh, uh, so the Rimil asked a question, and uh, the question is: since there is not much improvement even in the last five years. how should we organize ourselves to make the premier institutions accountable to implement reservation so i think um, either of you can answer this question do you, do you want to go professor men or should i you go for it uh, dr deepak okay uh i mean that's a that's a hard question and not unrelated to uh, the uh, previous uh, question actually right i mean i mean one has to recognize the uh, nature of the beast right i mean i mean i think i think you have to begin by uh, calling spade a spade uh, that really means uh, the following right at these elite technical institutions students coming in through reserve quotas are seen as trespassers right i mean, I mean that 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 that's simply the fact i mean i, mean, I, I, I can i can uh, uh, having been in one of these institutions for uh, long enough uh, i can uh, quite unequivocally uh, state that despite all the uh, micro uh, improvements and and, and these are uh, important uh, improvements if you will uh, the overwhelming climate for uh, somebody coming into these institutions from a historically marginalized uh, background is actually oppressive right and uh, you also have to recognize and and and, and this is probably Uh, more recent uh, in the last uh, 10 15 years uh, and and growing uh, intense with uh, every uh, passing day uh, is there is also a certain amount of what what should i uh, call i mean i mean i think i think it's it's, it's fair to uh, uh, characterize uh, this as uh, people actually revolting back i mean this this is really uh, also 
uh, the revolt of the entrenched uh, dominant uh, groups, right? And, and, and in some ways, you see some of that uh, happening as well. So in response to your uh, question, uh, the simple answer is, uh, what options uh, do we have? I mean, you, you have to uh, uh, persist, you have to uh, make your arguments, uh, never tire uh, making the same arguments uh, over and over again, uh, and uh, hope that you uh, prevail. I mean, when there, there really is uh, no other uh, way to do this. And you have to uh, get to this problem uh, through multiple means, right? I mean, take the instance of IAMs. Uh, it's really helped. I mean, though the uh, legal case that the alumni have filed at the Ahmedabad High Court has been languishing for uh, a, a bunch of years now and uh, has actually hasn't moved, that has generated a conversation, right? And then that has uh, generated some changes. And I, I, at my own institution, uh, at least on paper, it is no longer legitimate to say we shall not do reservation. Right? Only, 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 only uh, five short years ago, uh, that wasn't a given. Right? Well, thanks to uh, uh, intense mobilization by the alumni, uh, we've at least made it normatively legitimate to talk about reservations and uh, possibly even make a somewhat uh, half-hearted commitment to uh, actually implementing them uh, at the uh, research student level as well as at the uh, faculty level. I mean, we might not be actually delivering on our promise, but we are at least in a position to be able to uh, say we make this uh, promise. I mean, today clearly, uh, across IAMs, even with the picture that you see, it is no longer legitimate for any faculty member to uh, uh, rise up in a faculty meeting and say, uh, this is all bunk up. Well, at least that, that's not possible uh, anymore. And this, this, this movement has happened in uh, about uh, four or five years, uh, thanks to uh, a legal case that uh, hasn't gone too far itself. But it has catalyzed other uh, other things around uh, that case, right? So people have been talking about it. Conversations are uh, happening. Uh, so the short answer is one one has to be relentless. I mean, there there really is no uh, other way. You can't let your uh, guard down. Uh, this is a millennia old problem. I mean, how are you going to uh, solve this in two, three, four? Uh, five years when I mean, you're in it for a long haul and uh, it's it's a uh, real uh, long haul. So, uh, Professor Mins, you want to uh, respond further? Um, uh... Yeah, actually not really because you see, um, I mean, I don't have very many other options also. I totally agree with uh, Dr. Milgan uh, that you know, discussing and writing and deliberating on it to increase the, or to, to garner, no, to, to increase the sensibility of this matter and the need for this, you know, uh, it is, so representation, I mean, let's say reservation policy. As I said, it is for representation, right? So is representation not a right? I mean, it, it, it's, and things can get into that argumentative level. But then, unless it is accepted by the fellow citizens that equity and equality or equity can lead to equality, justice can lead to equality, and then a larger peaceful uh, society, Probably I'm having this very euphoric uh, imagination, but it, it needs to be also there. Otherwise, we don't head towards that positivity, right? And but then these little efforts, um, your um, uh, organizing this evening's talk, it 
is one such thing that should continue to happen because as uh, dr melgan mentioned like you no know, unless the, there was this case um, you know there wouldn't have been discussion in iim um, uh, fora and uh, forums uh, various forums in iim uh, and so talking about is the only way because how else can one um, make them accountable you can only get a question raised in the parliament that will be answered and that's it the matter is closed can anybody um, curtail the funding no because they are the decision makers and they, they and the, the, the or rather the decision makers are not in favor so you know these other methods even i don't have clue of except that increasing the sensibility and uh, you know from all quarters and all sections of the society that justice is a, a right and you know equality is not a privilege i think such things unless are discussed um it's not possible to go uh, to the next level uh yeah i think uh, if uh, there are no more questions i think we can wind up the event so yeah ma'am uh, you want to uh, answer amil's question amil has a question so do you want to answer that yes. okay uh, this this question uh, talking about my past and my uh, no stint in uh, mcc and the wcc i did i was for 5 years in chennai and let me be very upfront and say no my stay in tamil nadu did not contribute to shape my uh, you know um, my thought process and my activism let's say it's not an outcome of that it only these 5 years only helped me to exercise uh, to have a freer environment um, where i could explore my potential and prove my prove to myself my capabilities okay that, that that's the contribution these two institutions made because i was viewed as a north indian period you know and nobody who who would otherwise i know in those days were asked okay are you a nadar are you so and so you are not a brahmin right because the features don't align so i talked about the features right so i did not have to face those questions which on a daily basis i may have had to answer in the north india especially in either in bhu or in delhi university so not being in you know these other institutions but being in wcc and mcc enabled me to you know, prove to myself my capability quietly without being questioned of my identity so but then um, i think it's my i have had the privilege of being in a family who's been always socially uh, sensitive sensitive and active and therefore this kind of activism has come genetically rather than you know acquired from uh, my training because i'm a maths and a computer science person and uh, to be talking about all these me appear to be tangentially but then these are the matters of society and uh, family values uh, 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 were uh, uh, stated that we cannot forget the uh, uh, society we come from so unless everybody else treats you equal you need to be talking about the pains of your own people so uh, i guess that's why i'm here in spite of my mathematics and computer science um so if you're having no more questions then uh, we will thank the panelists today for uh, uh, the inputs for their hello yeah yeah coach can i just ask a question i think if you have time i'll give it so even as a question yeah go ahead yeah since um, professor deepak melgan mentioned about um, you know you had couple of students dalit students uh, working uh, with you who actually did the background work and uh, since uh, professor sanajari means also mentioned the importance of uh, you know uh, uh, students from oppressed classes to actually make their presence felt in these universities uh, so uh, like is like this uh, there is there is a distinction that professor gobal guru makes uh, like between theoretical brahmins and empirical shudras 
like uh, the lower caste or the oppressed sections often uh, because tends to be in a position where they just have to narrate their experiences and their hardships while um, you know, the, um, the 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 it will be the upper castes who will need to theorize and even to an extent do this kind of you know struggle uh, for the cause of uh, you know uh, the oppressed section so i don't know uh, I, I, i'm just i, I professor means can you just uh, from your experience say uh, how like um, na, like through your uh, like the career that you had like how uh, how easy was it to you know respond to uh, you know uh, these uh, injustices and uh, uh, and actually question the system uh, yeah um well i must accept my ignorance about the the the, 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 the theory that you quoted of gopal guru okay um i don't know whether i'll be able to understand that now even if you try to explain uh but i have a very i have a, a i may have a very different take um you know uh, a, 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 this may not be a very perfect analogy but uh, you see uh, when i had uh, been to my daughter's school to pick her up my daughter's cl classmate and friend asked her if i was her maid okay now um, i consider this instance like you know the upbringing of the child is to be blamed because the child has had that environment and therefore unless i mean there would therefore i would go ahead and i would be willing to accept the excuses and the reason why a person uh, who does not come from the deprived background and has been insensitive once faced with a situation and his is confronted or is faced with a situation that the other person says listen this has um, this is not right in the in in the in the eyes of the law or the constitution and because this uh, the, the following reasons i mean till such point i may i may be willing to forgive but that once or twice and the number of instances that the person would be in um, faced with i think it has to and would change this is what is my expectation okay uh, uh, and so uh, so with that hope i may be willing um, to let like, you know press on <laughs> to to uh, to keep on hoping that the, the, the people around me would have a change in attitude although i have had these train journeys i mean i do remember very uh, distinctly one of the uh, uh, professors from um, and he was assistant professor from iit madras was traveling next to me uh, you know and we were in the train from chennai to delhi and the kind of remarks he made in the train about the the he said these quota students you know and then he made his face as well as made went on to make his comment but i thought that was not the place to even get into any argument he he just took me as a uh, no assistant professor in jnu and that's it he didn't ask me for my identity um, and but but the way he conducted himself it was very very clear uh, the, his privileged background and the kind of comment he made but maybe such people would take a long long time to have a change in their uh, you know sensibility and their thought but at least there'll be some who would change and would be willing uh, to you know the share the space and recognize the potential of other and uh, being uh, the equal I mean, equality <laughs> as human rather than just by, by the matter of law you see there are certain things would have to come naturally too so i'm just hopeful about that time not in my children's uh, time also maybe my grandchildren's time it might take one or two more generations but i'm hopeful it should it, it can happen <laughs> I don't. I'm sure I have not answered your question, Libin. But uh, no, no man, it's uh, it's yeah, it's, it's it answers like you know there is always uh, a perspective. I mean, uh, I was just one. Uh, I was just curious to know uh, how your experience was. 
you know, when when this like as you said when some questions are posed so uh, yeah maybe maybe i can just come in here i think each each of us who are told that we are not meritorious i think it is important for us to know our potential because that is what gives us the strength to put up a strong fight yeah. uh, okay so uh, this is what uh, my stay in chennai and wct and mcc did i was able to assess my own potential and uh, i knew you know i could i could challenge the other person if i was challenged so i think it is what very important for many of us to also have that experience in order to you know make others more uh, increase the sensitivity or uh, sensibility of others yeah thank you ma'am thank you which means we need that opportunity also <laughs> <laughs> yeah